Thanks to popular demand, Paul Hudson can't make it to our podcast recording today. I'm Graham Morrison. I'm Mike Saunders. I'm Andrew Gregory. <laughs> and I'm Paul Hudson. Gosh, yeah. oh, no. I almost no, didn't make it. Quit. Okay. Welcome to episode 17 of the Tux Radar podcast. <laughs> Don't forget, we're publishing news, features, and more on tuxradar.com, so bookmark it today. In this episode, we have news of the first Linux web server botnet. The new kernel 2.6.31 has been released. A hot topic, MonoTouch finally brings Mono to the iPhone. Is that good or bad? And our open ballot. Should we, as a journalist community, focus more on non-Linux Unixes? And before our landlord kicks us out onto the street, please subscribe, give us some money, help us live like real men. Subscribe at tinyurl.com slash lxfpodcast. And definitely not tinyurl.com slash podcast lxf. One of the two will work, try them both. Please subscribe! So yes, the news. Of course, uh, top story this week. The first Linux botnet has been discovered, which is, of course, wonderful news because it proves that Linux is now mature enough to run botnet software. Uh, (laughs) What do you think, folks? Um, Are you excited? It's got 100 nodes have been discovered so far, so that makes it quite a baby in terms of botnets. Not millions. No, it's a little fledgling thing. Um, And they are running the NGINX web server, which is a a Otherwise known as NGINX. NGINX. (laughs) I've never heard anybody pronounce it in real life, I'm afraid. Go on, Gary. Pronounce Um, Vim for us. (laughs) <laughs> VI, VI. <laughs> yes NGINX but you remember these 100 nodes um, they mm-hmm. are all hooked up to fast internet connections and with very very high up times unlike most home PCs on dial up or whatever and, and like some Windows 98 bots exactly yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I mean I think it goes to show that a lot of Linux admins um, are perhaps complacent they assume that just because they're running Linux They've already got a machine that's secure, you know, and, and um, fail to update regularly. That's still important. Is it down to the updates, though? Well, is that really what you think caused it? Possibly, you know, there are holes discovered all the time, and uh, and and are swiftly patched in the free software world. So, is it um, an exploit in the web server that's been exploited? No, I keep on guessing. <laughs> <laughs> is it autonomous? The, I mean, the, has it spread to those? Hundreds? No, no, no. Uh, he, he, the guy thinks he's detecting two new IP addresses every hour. Um, which seems like an awful lot given there's only a hundred other things so far. But yeah, his belief is that it's more likely to be careless sysadmins had their root password sniffed. Right, right. Which is going to happen whether you're running OS X, Windows, <laughs> or MyCOS. Absolutely, mm. yeah. I mean, we've talked about it before. Linux isn't any more intrinsically secure to, through passwords. If you save your passwords in passwords.txt, <laughs> yeah. then you're bone no matter what OS you're on. Well, your password is password. <laughs> <laughs> password 1. Yes, but it means that Linux is finally getting uh, out there in the botnet world, which might scare some users, perhaps. Right. Time to move to OpenBSD, then, I think. Or maybe Ubuntu will start coming with a virus checker. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. What do you reckon, Andrew? Uh, I think we should give credit to the, the, the chap who you called this guy. Um, it's Dennis Sinagubko, who's done the work and found this botnet. But why Why now? Why is it new? Why, why have there not been more Linux botnets discovered? What's changed? A good question. <laughs> <laughs> what we need Listeners. is a group of Linux experts to sit around and, and discuss the. Oh, news what, of the what day. is the botnet doing? It's, we've got very little information. Well, okay, well, keep in mind, botnets are nothing new, right? Yeah. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if the first botnet ran on Linux because it was or egg drop, <laughs> the old IRC days, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the old days, and it probably ran on Linux because Windows didn't even have internet back then, if I can remember correctly. Well, I'm sure the original definition of a botnet isn't something malicious. Is no, exactly. It? It's just yeah. a, a bunch so of machines were communicating. Yeah. But now, now they're malicious. Now botnets. they're actually now they're not quite sentient. But they're... shouldn't a sysadmin know what he's running on his machines? Ah, yes. But as Mike said, um, it uses nginx which is an alternate web server running on a different port. So Apache, whatever you're running, Carrion runs fine on port 80, looking normal, serving out normal web pages, but on port 8080, uh, it's running Nginx with hideous virus stuff. So you think your system is running fine, unless you run Nmap frequently or mm-hmm. look for open ports or whatever. You think it's fine. It looks fine. You can't tell the difference. I mean, you know, Nginx isn't unusual. I think we use it here in future, actually. So basically all that's happened is that these machines have had their system administrator account compromised yep. and people have got in and installed Nginx and, yep. and that's, all, that's all the news is. It is, but it, it is serving up vast amounts of botnet stuff to Windows clients. 
It's so a, it's what's a, the problem? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a Linux botnet, yes, but it's actually act, acting as sort of master botnet to a Windows botnet. But what, what's the botnet as a part? Food chain. What's, where's the, what's the server that's keeping all these machines glued together? Skynet. <laughs> 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 Moving on, uh, Haiku has had an alpha released. Um, Mike, what do you res- what's your response to that in a haiku form, please? Well, I've, I've been... <laughs> <laughs> 575, Mike, you can do it. Oh, no, not off the top of my head. Um, N- nearly. <laughs> <laughs> really, thanks for counting. Um, I've been following haiku for a while. Um, well, about the last eight years, really. It was open BIOS and... Um, but the team have explicitly made it very difficult to use, um, to try out up until now. They haven't produced CD images until this alpha release because they didn't want people reporting all the bugs that they knew was there and all the other problems associated with it. So um, now with the alpha, they're actually re- ready to put it out to the masters. Um, and basically, it just looks and feels like open BIOS. Well, a BIOS, I should say. Do you know what haiku is, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was like six haikus strung together. <laughs> I'm not going to actually try here on the spot to do a haiku. Well, I can do if you want, but it will waste Graham's time. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I can do a mumbling haiku. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I looked at it when you put it up, Mike, and it does look like the old KDE theme still. The, yeah. the, the little tiny yellow toolbars, as if nothing's really changed. But, but that's the idea. They want to just, um, they don't want to set their goals too high for the first release. The first release is meant to basically be BIOS, back as it was in 2001. So it doesn't sound particularly impressive or amazing, but. They didn't want to get into the state of like React OS, where they kept chasing more and more and going further and further. They want to get a solid release out the door, which will be quite a simple OS, and then you know expand on it from there. But it's already very fast and, and lightweight, so I'm impressed. Are you going to switch? Um, yeah, in the beta release. Should we all switch for two weeks? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did a 30 days with the haiku article. You did? Yeah, about 18 yeah, months ago. And that had actual haikus in it. <laughs> <laughs> that was really cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. We should put that online. Is it online already? I don't think it is. All those Tux VR listeners yeah, who don't, don't buy their format, you heathen scum. I really loved it. I mean, the great thing was it booted so quickly. Yeah. But the, the biggest disadvantage was there were hardly any applications I could run on it. I mean, just getting oh, Firefox. Oh, was there no Firefox? Yes, yeah, yeah, they fixed that, didn't yeah, they? Yeah. Afterwards. Yeah. yeah. There, yeah. there is a, a native Firefox port at the moment, yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the goal is compatibility with... BOS, so you know there are a lot of old games and emulators and yeah. apps out there. And yeah. Abbey Word as well has a port. I mean, yeah, it's binary compatible, which is fantastic. Yeah, that's the idea. Very clever. And your haiku? <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember. I did a mumbling one. Haikus are easy, but sometimes they don't make sense. Refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite one. Uh, sometimes seventeen syllables ain't enough to express a. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, uh, Linux 2.6.31 has been released, uh, and Con Colivas is back, isn't he? He's with a new scheduler. This time it's personal. This time we can't even say its name because he's put a swear word into it. Um, but the new kernel release has some interesting features. It's got USB 3.0 support. Yeah. Mm. Years for any devices come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's got support for Intel's latest network cards, which aren't released till next year, uh, which is awfully, wonderfully future looking. That is cool though. I mean, if you map that on a time scale of Linux driver support. Well, that's exactly the thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's very often you get new distros coming out after six months and they're like, the devices are coming out at the same time and they haven't got support for them. You have to wait six more months. Whereas now, if the next kernels that come out, like, you know, Ubuntu's and your Suze's and your Fedora's, all shit with this kernel, yeah. it'll mean they actually have drive support as the devices are appearing, which is kind of how it should be, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, is that thanks to Intel, then? Is, is Intel part it'll of always, Intel always frees its uh, drivers nowadays, which is, which is great. And I guess they're part of the, they are a big part of the USB. They are. But I find the USB thing a bit confusing, actually, because USB 1.1 was called full speed. 2.0 <laughs> yeah. was called high speed. 3.0 is called super speed. Ah, wow. <laughs> Which means that 4.0 is called ludicrous speed. <laughs> <laughs> they sort of shut themselves in the foot by calling the first one full speed, didn't they? Well, no, that, that, was, the, that was done actually um, after, after the fact, retrospectively, because um, they thought that when 2.0 was released high speed, no one would want the, the old stuff anymore, unsurprisingly, because it's slower. So they looked at a way to, to rebrand it, so a lot of manufacturers called it full speed to imply that it was 2.0, but it isn't. Ah. It was a cunning marketing ploy to confuse consumers, and they got away with it, apparently, too, <laughs> without getting sued into dust. Um, but I think there are some performance boosts as well in there, the there are, there's, there's better memory management and apparently with fixes to EXT 3 and 4 file system reads are 3% faster 
Which really adds up, apparently. It would add up on, on yeah. a, yeah. A on a bonnet. Big, on a bonnet. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an awesome quote here from Stephen J. Vaughan Nichols. Uh, he said, under the old memory behavior, your performance could slow down by 1,000% or more. <laughs> which, <laughs> which shows a dramatic <laughs> lack of mathematics skill, I think. <laughs> but Con Colabas is back with a new scheduler. And... Uh, Anyone know anything about it? Well, like you say, it's got a name which implies it probably won't get into the kernel. And I saw it's his... called BFS, and if Graham could do the beeping sound, <laughs> <laughs> it's called the brain <laughs> brain beep <laughs> scheduler <laughs> because it throws everything out about what we know is good about how to design a modern scheduler in scalability. Apparently, what it do says Con. That sounds ace. Well, I, I'm I'm I think we should have pluggable schedulers in the kernel. I think, explain what it means first. I think we should be able to have... Um, so a scheduler um, guarantees which processors run and switch between them. So you've got schedulers geared towards desktop performance and you've got schedulers d- geared towards servers as well. Um, and historically, the kernel has only had one. So it's, it's one scheduler trying to do all these different jobs for different types of machines. Um, but... I think we should be allowed to change them, just like we can try different file systems for different, um, you know, tasks and scenarios. Um, because is the current one called the completely fair scheduler? Yeah, but uh, I don't want a fair scheduler. I want one that puts, you know, complete bias and priority. Yeah, yeah. I, I still have a problem now. Um, when I'm running make ISO FS, making an LXF DVD, it just freezes up the box effectively. Firefox just grinds to a, a, a halt um, because of this activity in the background. So can't you just change its priority? Does that? Not I work? could do, but I don't want to, you know, end up re nicing to rather put in a whole new schedule. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Make I, I want somebody else to do the work, you know, um, so that a, a, a background disc-intensive task takes ten seconds longer. But actually, a problem I, I, we've had in the past that doesn't annoy me no end is if if your server's under heavy load and you try and log in, mm. it'd be like, no, I'm sorry, root, you can't do that, and you're like, no, I'm. Just forget Apache temporarily. Yeah, yeah. I am more important. I want to see what's going on. But, uh, yeah, that shouldn't happen. By default, a, a root login should, uh, <laughs> should should take priority. It's a problem we've had for years with computers, isn't it? I remember the Amiga. You could change the scheduler. I used to spend ages. Really? Yeah, yeah. I used to spend ages messing around with Task Manager on the Amiga, just seeing which which one would render my imagined scenes faster. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Amiga in better than Linux Shocker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, possibly. I mean, it didn't didn't really do any good. So if there's one scheduler for all Linux kernels at the moment, does that mean that the your um, your Acer Aspire One is um, it's here next to me is is, <laughs> is prioritizing you know servers just as much as yeah. you know, the Linux format server? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's not very clever, is it? No, <laughs> no. Well, doesn't it? Wasn't there something ages ago about? Um, prioritising interactive stuff. Yeah, I remember that coming was that, up. Was that replaced by the completely fair scheduler that ignores what you're doing and does what it wants to do? <laughs> there, there was the O1 scheduler or something, wasn't there? The ON. I forget. Yeah, I remember it coming up, but nothing seemed the to happen. The idea being that if you're working in X, it's quite important. Yeah. And, you know, Apache can do what it likes, but I'm working in X, quite frankly, get well, off. Well, like Graham said, you can re-nice stuff um, yourself. You can go around re-nicing processes <laughs> to change priorities, to. but you shouldn't have to. But yeah. thought, that was the point that X stuff started at a higher priority. I think it does anyway. Yeah, I think some distros have done it. They've run it at priority minus 19 or, or 19, <laughs> one of them. <laughs> Whichever one's the fastest. But, uh, That's extreme, isn't it? Isn't that, isn't that before doing anything else? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it is, just so that you can always move the mouse cursor. Yeah. <laughs> What's minus 19 in percentage terms? Minus 1,000%. <laughs> um, he gave lots of great reasons why it's, um, it's good. And he says... Um, because it performs so ridiculously well on what it's good at, despite being simple. Uh, it, it's designed in such a way that Mainline would never be interested in adopting it, which is how I like it. <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure why he's doing the work then, but there you go. Well, he's probably bitter from um, previous. Yeah, yeah, he had a bit of a bad time, didn't he? Previously. Yeah. He also says, because it will make people sit up and take notice of where the problems are in the current design, which... Um, sort of lacing down a little bit, doesn't it? Exactly. We, we could get a, a, a full-scale kernel fork then. If this scheduler is really, really good and Linus doesn't want to put it in the kernel because con- con. <laughs> Colibas doesn't want to put it in the kernel then is it time for somebody to step up and make... Well, presumably it's GPL so yeah. they can stick it well, in the they, kernel. They, they I mean, can just do it the last time and re-implement it under a different name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like Ice Weasel. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll, it'll, Ingo already, has already been involved looking at the patches and stuff and has, has, has tried to be friendly and welcoming, saying, welcome back and let's do it together and work on it. And, and Con's response was, blah, read the FAQ. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, he's given it a name that's, you know, not very palatable. No. But, but I wonder if the actual design and the code, maybe he's written the code deliberately really ugly or, or obfuscated in order to stop it getting in. Quite possibly. This fortnight's hot topic is Novell releasing Mono Touch for the iPhone. Mono Touch is a software development kit for iPhone developers to use Mono and C Sharp to develop iPhone applications rather than Apple's Objective C and its SDK. The reason why this is interesting to us as Linux users is because it's based on the Mono toolkit, the open source toolkit um, developed by Novell and released for free. Is this a good thing? I mean, the thing is, it's expensive. Uh, for a single user, if you're just a personal user who wants to publish your own apps, it's going to cost you 399 US dollars. Per year. Per year. Yeah, just a year of updates. After that, you're isolated. I mean, that, that single user also is non-transferable. So I, I couldn't let you use it for an hour while I go out for lunch. Really? For that, you need the Enterprise Edition, which is $1,000 per year. Per developer. Per developer, <laughs> yeah. Well, you can get a five-developer license for... Three nine 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 dollars. Whoa! It, it's, so is it's, that like four thousand yeah, dollars? Yeah, yeah, almost. Yeah. It, is this for making apps to deploy around your business, or can you actually get stuff into the App Store? Has Apple you approved get, anything? Well, it's yet? for both. It's for both. They'll be hoping that the personal edition is for people who would rather program in C sharp and use and use Mono dot net three point five. I'm just wondering if Apple will allow these apps into the App yeah, Store. Yeah, they, they already have sort of like two hundred apps based on C sharp in the App Store. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so you can do it. It, it works around the restriction of. I mean, the iPhone doesn't allow you to do any just in time compilation. Yeah, okay. that's how Java works. So it it pre compiles everything. Everything to ARM. Um, everything, yeah, everything across um, the board. Binary, it's a pretty flat binary. Right, it's it works. Yeah, but the difference okay. is that the Enterprise One um, can do ad hoc deployment, whereas personal okay. can't. It does sound really cool technology. It sounds. I mean, I'd be really interested in it if if it was cheaper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just yeah. I can't even envisage trying it out. You know, if it's going to cost me three nine nine in the end to publish an app with it. Do, do you think this, this price is so high at the start to recoup the development costs? Because it's obviously been a lot of work. I don't know. It seems to me after you know following Miguel de Casa, whose whose project it is following his blog over the last 12 months while this has been happening, it seems to me that it started off as a personal project because it was kind of cool and Novell have taken it up because they've obviously seen it's got a commercial potential. Um, and coming from the open source world, and look, we've talked about Mono a lot, that seems a little bit incongruent and a bit disappointing. And I can't imagine Novell making enough money that it's going to, they're going to be able to make a business out of it. Well, so well, why it works for Unity, doesn't it? Have you seen Un Unity? Yes, before? yeah, Unity is great. That's, that's a 3D <laughs> yeah. uh, open gel implementation on C Sharp, on Mono. Yeah. Also yeah. closed source. Yeah. They're making money. Yeah, and they've seen them making money out of Unity 3D. Exactly. And they've thought, you know, 200 apps published through that, they could publish it through Mono Touch. Mm, exactly, yeah. And it would recoup the cost. It wouldn't be profitable, I doubt, but it would recoup the cost. Yeah. I think it's very cool technology. Well, well how, um, much, how much are you interested in it then, Paul? You'd love C Sharp. You're I, programming if, on the if, iPhone. If it were open source, I'd be using it today. Yeah. You think it, it would really Te be... Technologically, it is so superior to what Apple has turned out. Right. It's embarrassing for Apple, I think. Really? Yeah, they've done an awesome job. Even against the whole Xcode frame it, it, system it, and everything? What they've done with the Xcode thing, uh, with the dot, the dot nibs, basically the interface files, mm -hmm. is incredible. They've, they've basically taken the modern develop approach using something called partial classes. It's very, very advanced technology stuff, and it's great. I love it. But it's not free. And that really irks me. You know, one of the reasons I didn't, I didn't really like... Um, uh, QT originally was because of the funny licensing. Yeah, I'm not sure that's that still the case. Funny licensing, like GPL, unless you want to be do a closed source, we have to do it again from scratch or whatever. Uh, yeah, it, it was is. it was messy licensing <coughs> basically. I, I never really liked that. But that, that's a technicality in the license. It, it is, I know. But the thing is, I I I, I chose to commit to Mono because I thought it's a great platform on Linux, right? Free, open, mm. and afterwards, and now they're moving the goalpost a little bit. They say, hey, well, that, now this bit over here, if you want to do that, well, that's not free anymore. And that's actually very irritating. I, I wouldn't, and it now makes me a bit feel a bit dirty <laughs> yeah. for using Mono in the first place because it's now no longer a free platform on Linux, or at least fully anyway. You can't go across and do more with it through limitations, and that's irritating for me. They should actually have a free version if your apps are going to be free. Yeah, there like, you go, like Qt. Well, yeah, but it's all mixed up that with Apple. That would be incredible. It's all mixed up with Apple's Apple Store kind of policy. So at some point, you've got to pay a developer's license, and it's going to be closed source to a degree. 
But yeah, but if, if it was, if your app is actually licensed under the GPL, yeah, yeah, that's because that's what the iPhone, what, what other, to be fair, <laughs> other non Unix platforms are really missing. Stacks of great free software. Yeah, yeah. I know OS X's got some and Windows has got some, whatever. But there's so much more on Linux that never gets ported. And if they had, had the same thing on iPhone, it'd be incredible. Just everything free, 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 free. Show Apple how it's supposed to be. You know, make the iPhone free as, at least on the, on the app side. Yeah. it'd be incredible. And they could do that very easily. I, yeah, they wouldn't lose any money from that. They wouldn't. Or at least, at least if they said, "Hey, once we recoup our costs, we'll make it a free version available, GPL, whatever." Yeah, yeah. But I mean, if, if you're spending three hundred ninety nine dollars on the personal edition, you're going to hope to make a lot of money. So it, it doesn't matter. You know, those people can have their commercial products, and people who are interested in creating a quick app using Mono on their iPhone. They can. Shame also that it's per year. Yeah, that seems really tight. Yeah, I agree. It's especially coming from the open source world. You don't. That kind of thing is just so unfamiliar now. Yeah, it's, the, it's the kind of the world that we left a long time ago. Correct, and, yeah. and, it, and especially from a company that fully understands that and people who fully understand that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I've never really liked Unity for the same, Unity for the same reason. You know, the, it's wonderful stuff, really amazing toolkit, but not free. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They've taken something that was free and closed it. Yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, all respect to the BSD folks, it does irritate me no end. You should, the fact that people have put so much work into it and they just take it, make it closed. Yeah, yeah. That's not how it should be, I don't think. But does Novell really understand free software, open source? I mean, this is the, the same crowd of people who invented the mixed source. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We're presumably with Miguel de Casa at the helm of this particular project, you know, there's, there's, there are going to be few better people. Sure, but then I, I'm, sure, understand. I'm sure Miguel didn't come up with the it, pricing policy. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, how much effort, Paul, has this taken? I mean, would it be difficult for a commu- for the community to do a similar thing with Mono? Well, the thing is, it's taken a lot of effort, but most of the effort has been open sourced already. Right. So they put a lot of work into the um, ahead of time compile stuff. I, I showed you ages ago. Uh, we talked about it off the podcast. Um, something called Fire Engine for PS3. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the Sony uh, toolkit for making games. They made a binding to that for C Sharp Fire Engine. Yeah, and inside that took a lot of work to make all this ahead of time compilation stuff work. That, that kind of work's already done. So they ported that to the iPhone, fair enough. The ARM, fair enough. That makes sense. Um, they had to do bindings for all the stuff. That, not terribly easy. Then they had to make one of develop work on Mac, which they, which they did. Yeah, yeah. There, as of two point two, it's now officially cross platform. Uh, and they had to do the whole bit in between the Xcode push stuff. Get to be able to push to the iPhone. Don't you push it out to the iPhone? So there has been some new work done. Not a lot. But some. It is feasible that the community, if there was enough demand, could create yeah, it, an course, open source. Of course, version. it's feasible. Yeah, they've, they've done all the basic work there already. You want to share that and just modify the bits on top. It is feasible. I don't think it's going to happen because Novell has a history of anyone skilled this area. They'll just hire, yeah, or intern, or get working very, very closely with them. And also, this is this is going to be only feasible for OS ten users, Apple OS ten users who perhaps aren't going to worry about spending. Four hundred dollars on a, an SDK. Yeah, maybe they're used to it. Yeah, I mean, uh, they obviously are. They obviously are used to it. You know, they're, they're spending t- money on tools and stuff on iPhone. Uh, yeah. On the, uh, is it sixty pound, hundred bucks a year? That's pay for the right to do iPhone apps anyway. It's not. So yeah, it all adds up, and they probably are used to it by this point. So. Yeah. Yeah. But as, as free software users, it just irks me that they, they think this is okay. And the stratospheric pricing as well. I mean, it's yeah. it's not even... It's not cheap in the slides. No, it's it's not. You can't say it's like um, crossover office or something like that, you know, which is perfectly reasonably priced. Yeah. And, you know, and you don't really begrudge them their proprietary sure. version. Uh, when, you, when you pay 30 quid towards it, you think, hey, I'm helping fund wine. Yeah, yeah. yeah and exactly. <laughs> and then all, all that work goes back into wine. Exactly, That's yeah. not exactly the case here. Well, obviously, any, any money you pay towards them will show them that Mono is good and will help fund Mono and stuff. And yeah. they have to make money from, money from Mono somehow, don't they? They have to get something back from it. Is, is, has that been their motivation? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe this is the real... The this, real this story the behind all along, coming yeah, out. All yeah. along. Once we can make yeah. money by closed sourcing bits. When it, when it gets to a critical mass, you know, Novell are going to take Mono and really capitalise on the fact that it owns the source code. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> and with such stirring anti Novell debate, we come to the halfway reminder still to come. Discovery of the fortnight slash week slash month and our open ballot. Should we focus on other Unices than just Linux? And just, I know people are wondering, just so you know, we are well aware that Linux is not technically a Unix. <laughs> <laughs> and with all those japes, we come to discovery of the week. Now, who to go first? Eeny, meeny, miny. That was you then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was. 
<laughs> My discovery of the week is MDD Clone, um, which is an open source, well, not open source, but it's a modern re implementation of Mercenary, Damocles, and Dion Crisis, or Dion Crisis. But I'm it's not- a Windows program, it's a Windows game. No, it's on Linux now. Really? Is this news? Th- that brain? is news because I know MDD clone well. I'm still subscribed to the mailing list. Really? Yeah. It's it's on Linux. Um, for those who, who've never heard of it, you don't read the mailing list. Do you? <laughs> no, it uses a terrible format, but that's that's something else. It, it posts the links to new messages, and you have to click on the oh, link no. to go back to the forum to read the message. So, but for those who've never heard of it before, um, Mercenary was a, a, a game released in 1985 for the classic 8-bit platforms, and what it was it was game. incredible. It was it was a full first-person 3D planet exploration game, um, and you could also go in buildings and fly aircraft and stuff. And it was. It was sensational for such old... I can remember the day I got back from Derby Market. <laughs> I put the tape in my Commodore 64, loaded it up, and what happens is at the very beginning you, you see your spacecraft crash into some planet like that, mm. and all you see is like this airport building, a cube, and this thing that looks like a dart on the runway yeah, yeah. in a car, and you just can't believe it at the time. It's just amazing. And, and Yeah, and you walk around and you yeah. explore, and, uh, and, and for the time it was... There's no instructions as well, I remember the game. They just gave you basic key commands, so right. you walked over to that, that salt and pepper pot car shaped thing you press B and it would board and then you could press 1, 2, 3 and it would speed up down the road it to go to the I felt like the whole world was open to me. So it, it might not be so mind blowing for people today um, but the, uh, the thing with MDD clone is um, there's an SDL version which looks just like the original, very wireframe and there's an OpenGL version with lots of, ex- lots of extra textures as well, have you seen that? No, I, what, so what to because Dam- Mercenary was wireframe Damocles was filled in vectors Was it? Was that yeah, like Amiga yeah. days? So yeah, I only exactly. really played Mercenary I only really exactly. knew Mercenary but, So yeah, presumably they, they've done that for yeah, Damocles it must be, Yeah, the OpenGL versions look great so I highly recommend That's it That's a Tony. fantastic find I'm going <laughs> to go straight you. back I'm going to go now <laughs> Oh, mine, mine's going to look really poor after that. Graham, <laughs> <laughs> what's okay. your discovery of the week? Mine is the discovery that the Windows 7 colour palette looks really good on KDE 4. How does... Eh? <laughs> it looks Hell. really good. What, did you I run it through wine or something? No, I just happened to be messing with my colour settings. And you can do this from the system settings application in KDE, clicking on appearance and then colours. And then... That you can ch- you can be really anal about it and change all of the colours, but mainly change the window background to an HTML value of B7 D0 E6, which is that pale blue colour used kind of by Vista on Windows 7. And it, I think it looked great on the KD desktop. Wow! It, it really really made my desktop feel completely new and clean and refreshed. Changing the background colour. Yeah, <laughs> it's just the window background. I mean, you, also changing the button background to CFDC E9, and it transforms the KD desktop. I think it's a great colour. They should even think about it as the default for next time. Cause Surely D9 is better than E9. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> D9 kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. Can we get a screenshot of this then in the uh, yeah, podcast sure. notes? Yeah. Great. Yeah. So all this time they've been messing around with plasmoids and stuff. Just change the colour palette. <laughs> I mean, there are, there are actually plenty of Windows 7 colour palettes you can get with KD by clicking on the Get Hot New Stuff right. and download them that way, but... Really, just change the window background colour. Do you think it'll work in XFCE as well? Um, in fact, it'll work equally well because it's just the colour. Would you like to hear some awesome trivia? Yeah, go on. Uh, uh, a sister magazine of Linux formats, I'm not mentioned which one, but you can probably figure it out, recently shipped a DVD with uh, a Windows 7 customization cool toolkit that made your Vista look like Windows 7. And they had to yank the CD at the last minute because they re- recognised it actually did that by copying all the Windows 7 icons into an EXE file and basically all the backgrounds oh, as well. Dear. So they, they realised they're ripping off Microsoft massively and had to yank it at the last minute. That's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it was someone's idea to do this apparently, yeah, so that they realised at the last minute for Without knowing what it did, yeah. Without realising, yeah. So, uh, yes, interesting. That's Super Mario Chronicles revisited. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's actually an interesting point because some of the themes on the KD looks website do include the bitmaps from windows which is Dodgy. bad we shouldn't be doing that no shouldn't be doing that no no i mean distros we've got to be careful not to include these things but yeah hex yeah. values for colors can we steal those from oh. sure the copyright don't they yeah. <laughs> change them a little well, bit the, the overall experience <laughs> is probably <laughs> copyrighted so. um paul i've got two two <laughs> two yes as usual no yeah but the first one's really interesting because um i discovered while i was off sick last week I was trawling through Wikipedia like I always do, 
And I discovered why. <laughs> why the US flag flies backwards on the space shuttle. I never realised before, but if you look at it, it's backwards. And okay. There's, there's actually a reason. It's not, it's not some... I thought they'd reversed the mis- Not a mistake, yeah. <laughs> it's, con- it's conspiracy theory. So they didn't it? actually land on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can see it's flipped. But apparently, it's the rules. It's actually by, by rules that the, the American flag flown an aircraft must look like the, the mast of the flag is next to the nose cone. So the flag is flying in the wind. Hence, the shot goes forwards, the flag must go backwards in the wind as it flies. Oh, I thought it was if you were in a jet in front and you were looking through your um, re- you know, rear view mirror. mirror and then you'd see an anomaly, <laughs> like when it says ambulance backwards. Yeah. On it. No, no, it's not. It's because of that. What do they do when their planes reverse? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's like a hologram. <laughs> and you look at it perhaps changes LCD monitor incidentally I saw both the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle in the sky really? Um, from from lovely f- south of France yeah, yeah. across the sky <laughs> one following the other it was, it was magnificent Ooh, great yeah. or you had something in your eye <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, moving on my, my actual discovery of the week is, is just actually something to help a listener out a uh, uh, chap called Hugh wrote in to say this there seems to be some confusion within the Ubuntu community regarding the feature known as the computer janitor. I've looked for answers on the web a few times, and there don't seem to be many people who know whether it's safe to use. I certainly have been brave enough to try it. So my discovery of the week is really to actually look into it and find out what it actually does. And uh, it does three things. Computer janitor does three things. Firstly, it removes things that were installed as dependencies that are no longer needed. So libraries and stuff. If you install uh, KD4 like we did, <laughs> it's, uh, get it on there and you remove KD but it leaves behind libkd, fubar, bars, whatever it, it thought it needed them it did need them for a while but now it's no longer needed it will remove those secondly it will remove packages that are no longer supported and therefore may be a bit unshaky or uncertain on your, on your distro and thirdly it adds any configuration tweaks that were made in newer distros that won't apply to your system so these are quite good the first thing's nice because it frees up this space you don't need anymore good last two can be dangerous I think um, uh, you know it Configuration tweaks, they were added in, say, 9.04. You may have changed something else in your 8.04 for, for upgraded, so they may have been applied for a reason. Um, so I'll, be, I'll be a bit careful using that one. Uh, and the middle one, removing packages that aren't, aren't supported, is a bit dangerous because um, we tried a mic system and it mm. wanted to remove VirtualBox, which he actually likes and uses all the time. Yeah, that, that's because I'd installed it from the VirtualBox site. I'd installed yeah. it. So it wants to remove so. that, which is a bit lame. Yeah, so if, you, if all we want to do is remove packages that are no longer needed, you know, dependencies, we have to do is run apt hyphen get auto remove and it'll do the same thing from the command line. Um, although you can use computer janitor to see what it would do, you run, click the command, it'll show you things it will remove, just deselect things you don't you actually do want to keep and then remove them. But remember, it will apply configuration tweaks, so be careful. Whoa, and that just leaves Andrew Gregory. My mine is actually a rediscovery, and it's uh, I've rediscovered how gosh darn cool Neil Stevenson is. N E A L. Um, He's, um, he's a, a writer, but he's also a, a, quite a hardcore, techie, geeky chap. So much so that on page 480 of his, the novel that I read last weekend is half a page of Pearl script. Great. It's, and I did, was, did you run it? I was, I was shocked. <laughs> it's, um, this novel, Cryptonomicon, it's, um, it's set in, it's mostly set in World War Two. There's a lot of, about Bletchley Park and Pearl was around. Back like when Pearl was popular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the action also flips to the present day. Ah. Spoiler alert! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've ruined chapter two for you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's there's a, a discussion of, of cryptography, and during which you know this function is expressed as half a page of Pearl code. You know. Cool. How, how cool is that? Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be good for the audiobook version, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so if you just want to check it out, it's on page 480. Just flip, go to Waterstones, flip through. There it is. Speaking of um, World War II cryptography, Alan Turing is apparently uh, forgiven. What, you mean he's not gay anymore now? He was gay, <laughs> but we don't mind anymore. Oh, cool. That's, <laughs> that's very big of us. Yes. <laughs> after, after he killed himself for uh, being completely cut off from the rest of his world. Salt mate. Yes. We're very sorry, Alan. Who, who's saying sorry? Gordon Brown. Ah, the Gordon Brown. Who is, the, nice. who is the Prime Minister of the UK, for our listeners who is don't he? know that. <laughs> <laughs> that was pseudo open ballot. <laughs> this fortnight is the question should we focus on other Unices than just Linux of course we are, we are aware that GNU is not Unix 
Um, GNU's not Unix. Um, but there are lots of other Unices out there. GNU is not the only fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, OS X, BSD, Open Solaris. Should we... As Minix. Minix, thank you, Mark. Heard. Y- yes. <laughs> well, let's not include that, but... Should we be pushing these? Should we be uh, you know, making people aware of this awesome operating system type stuff that's out there? When the uh, SCO debacle kicked off in 2003, Skoda. when SCO oh, took Skoda. IBM Sorry. to court about the whole um, Linux kernel source code infringing thing, I thought it, um, it was great that FreeBSD was around because if something really bad happened to Linux, we had a very close operating system, a very similar operating system to fall back on that ran 99% of the same software as Linux. So I think it's a good idea. I think it's good to have a, a kind of backup. I don't use FreeBSD much these days, but I really like it because if something terrible happens to Linux, then we, a lot of us can switch to FreeBSD very quickly without having a major impact. Well, I'm going to say no. Um, I think it's great that things like FreeBSD are around, and I'm sure they'll continue to be around because people are enthusiastic and they keep up development. Mm. But in- increasingly now, I'm... I think that we need to have a single Linux with a single desktop. Um, how, supporting and blurring the line between Linux and other free Unixes is is, is uh, diluting our argument. One of the great things about Linux and open source and all that is that there's so much choice. We've talked about that a lot. But I think for a single unified front for the public to try and increase open source support, we, we have to know. We won't um, dilute our coverage. So you say you're going to write to Steve Jobs and say, give up, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do anything about that. But, you know, I think on the open source platform, we should, we should make Linux the shining star of the, of the whole uh, community. So you won't be uh, selling articles to PC Plus, you know, <laughs> tell, telling them that uh, Hurt, this is the year of Hurt on the desktop. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if something else comes along, if free, free BST overtakes Linux, I'm, that's brilliant. That's what competition and open source is all about. But in terms of journalists giving increased kind of coverage to these things, I think it, I think it dilutes our argument. Well, I think, I think it's great for folks to try. You know, go out there and get some ideas. You know, I, I find it pretty terrifying when you read stories about how um, uh, Steve Ballmer won't let people um, use iPhones at yeah, Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is terrifying, I think. You know, oh, of course, yeah. Let, let folks try it, see what they think, see what they like, learn from it, and then try something else, and maybe take their ideas across, steal the best ideas, move on. Um, that's a good idea. That, that, that works really well. So, you know, we, we, we put, we put up, um, a story about Open Solaris a couple of days ago on the website, talking about how it differs from Linux. So if you've got some Linux experience, go and check out Open Solaris. And that was really popular on Slashdot, all over Twitter, as dig. Great. People like, people just want to know. Yeah. They're just yeah. curious. You know, they yeah. want to find out what's good and why it's cool and, and take the best bits of Linux. So I think it works both ways. But when stuff patently isn't as good as Linux, for example, for example, the herd. Sorry to pick on it again. <laughs> but, you know, surely it's a waste of time for us to to give give it that much coverage. Ah, but there will there will be a lot of people who say the herd is technically a better kernel than Linux. Sure, it doesn't have hardly any drivers at the moment, and it's very, very immature. <laughs> at the moment. But <laughs> yeah. people will say, they'll say that, and they're just coming now. Take a pitchfork. So, yeah, the, the herd is effectively useless at the moment, but its design um, is, is uh, fascinating and, and it's deeply technical and complicated. But there will be some people who say that is a line worth pursuing in the future. But is, is there anything that we can take from that, from that now? I mean, isn't the herd you know, fundamentally differently designed to a monolithic kernel? Such it, as it is. It's, Whoa! It, it's, it's highly, highly modular. Yeah, you can pull and plug things out while it's still running. So um, like, a, like a scheduler, for example? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but you'd have to reboot um, your uh, Linux machine to change schedule. Um, you probably have to compile it in um, to the kernel itself. So the herd, I, I'm, you know, I'm just, I see what you're saying, but um, I think a lot of potentially good ideas could just disappear if we said, you know, let's focus all our energies on what we've got at the moment. Linux could stagnate. But maybe we should try with our readers, perhaps, of, of Linux format, you know, just make it an issue, the open Solaris issue. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a bit tedious, isn't it? Uh, you know, I think at this point, people are, are beyond. Linux being something different, and they're more interested in what differentiates distros. They're at a more fine-grained level now. And that's, I think, very interesting because it means that if someday we do switch to FreeBSD, it'll boot up into a KDE desktop, mm. and people may not even realize they're using, not using Linux, you know? What, when does it become clear they're not using Linux? I, uh, yeah, I think if the, uh, if the abstraction levels for like hardware management and software installation 
uh, developed to a certain level, then yeah, it, it doesn't matter if you're running FreeBSD, NetBSD on some random device, and the desktop looks the same. That's, this sounds like a ringing endorsement for uh, foreign Unices apart from Graham. <laughs> Who is an avid Mac user? <laughs> <laughs> you heard that here first too. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, GNU's not Unix and neither is Linux. Love, we come to the end of episode 17 of the podcast. Don't forget, you can find... Oh, all- hang, hang on a minute here. Notes. How, how on earth can you be wrapping up this show? You came late to the show. You don't have the right to wrap <laughs> it up. The door was stuck. Oh, yeah, right. We all managed to get in fine. It's just some excuse. It's always another excuse. And because of that, I've got one more thing. In 2006, there was an EU study which calculated the cost to redevelop Linux kernel 2.6.8 in a traditional proprietary setting. I want everybody to guess how much they calculated it would cost to redevelop. 2.7 billion euros. Okay, that's Andrew's guess, 2.7 billion euros. I'm waiting for Google to load. (laughs) (laughs) 2.71 billion euros. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Okay. I think I think ten billion euros. I think ten billion. <laughs> Why are we talking euros? <laughs> the answer is in euros. It was commissioned by the European Commun- Union, wasn't it? EU, yeah, yeah. Have you not got a mental pound converter for everything that important? <laughs> that really annoys me. I don't. I... All right. <laughs> ten billion pounds. Just to annoy Andrew. <laughs> ten billion pounds. Right. Two point seven billion pounds from Andrew. Ten billion the euros. <laughs> this is confusing. Uh, uh, Graham. Who, who was responsible for doing the work? It, it's Swiss France. It, 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 it yeah. <laughs> Liechtensteiner. It wasn't anyone in the UK and anybody to do with like um, the NHS IT project, was it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be slightly more conservative and go with 1.5 billion krona. Krona. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, no, in, exactly. in euros... It's far more than that. It's far more. 1.5 billion euros. Yeah. The answer is 822 million oh, euros. Wow, what a so, bargain. So this would be. <laughs> yeah. It just mean Graham wins. It does indeed. Graham, you win today's I, I one the, more I get thing. the contract. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good luck redeveloping that. Yeah. I'm going to love doing the NVIDIA stuff. And with that, we come to the real end of our <laughs> podcast. Tune in in two weeks for more wild misestimations of costs. <laughs> and more Linux news and reviews. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.